name's Andre Almeida. I am a man with a plan. Oh, hi there. You didn't think I'd miss the 25th anniversary of my favorite video game series, did you? Man, 25 years ago, Resident Evil came out. Can you believe that I'm older than Resident Evil? To celebrate 25 years of this wonderful video game franchise, I thought it'd be a great idea to sort of recap Resident Evil's 1, 2, and 3 in a fun celebratory way. The classic trilogy, if you will. This video is purely a recap. Um, if you want some videos with a little bit more depth and like gameplay analysis and all that kind of stuff, I do have a mainline Resident Evil retrospective series on my channel. Watch those videos after this one. All right, let the celebration begin. Oh my God, I didn't know that. I didn't know it actually rang. Should I pick it up? Hello? Hey, Susie. Oh, hey, Racevic. How are you? Guys, it's Racevic, my famous YouTuber friend. I heard you're calling your new video Resident Evil 25 years later. That's kind of my thing. Can you not do that? No. Fuck. Released in 1996, Resident Evil, or as it's known by its Japanese title, Biohazard took the world by storm. Starting its life as a remake of cult classic Famicom horror game, Sweet Home, that game's producer, Tokuro Fujiwara, wanted to do what he couldn't with the Famicom's hardware. That being, create a truly immersive and terrifying horror game where survival against impossible monsters was the focus. Directed by Shinji Mikami and written by Kenichi Iwao, Resident Evil would coin the legendary genre naming convention, Survival Horror. Seeing games that had come before do similar things to what Mikami and his team wanted to accomplish, Survival Horror was the most appropriate genre for this type of action-adventure game. Resident Evil sees the character of your choosing, either Star's Alpha team members, Jill Valentine or Chris Redfield, exploring and looking for their fellow missing Bravo team members in an abandoned mansion in the Arclay Forest, a region on the outskirts of Raccoon City. After their chopper lands in the woods, Alpha team is attacked by a pack of vicious dogs. As their pilot chickens out and leaves them for dead, the team retreat into the iconic mansion, where they quickly discover this house's inhabitants aren't exactly of the living human variety. Returning to the mansion's main hall, your character discovers their captain has gone missing. And so begins Resident Evil. Resident Evil's gameplay formula was revolutionary for its time. Besides RE, the only thing that really played like it was Alone in the Dark, a title that had released a few years before RE's creation, where that game borrowed more from point-and-click adventure games and was admittedly rough around the edges, Resident Evil presented players with a much more polished and fast-paced gameplay loop than what Alone in the Dark was offering. RE is quite the challenging game, featuring a fairly large interconnected world with tons of backtracking, puzzles, scarce items like ammo, healing, and save files, and some of the strongest basic enemies you'd ever see in a PS1 game. Seriously, the monsters in this title take a lot of punishment, as well as deal it back to Chris and Jill. That's where the survival element of Resident Evil really shines. More often than not, it's best to avoid combat altogether, saving your precious resources for a larger boss or a difficult hallway that might be packed to the raft with monsters. With RE being quite the difficult game, the puzzles aren't that brain-busting. They often stand as progression roadblocks that you have to solve to advance in your escape, but they mostly come down to find four things, put them in a door, push these blocks around. You actually do that one a lot. And some of them are pretty gimmicky that might even lead to world-class memes. Jill? Is that you, Jill? What happened? Hurry! This way! That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. One of my favorite elements of this title is its level design. I love how well-crafted and memorable each and every room is. It feels like a Metroidvania-style game in a contained three-dimensional world. Speaking of 3D graphics, Resident Evil doesn't actually have much of that going on. I'm sure you're curious how Capcom managed to create such a visually engaging game world back in 1996. Well, <laughs> that's where my second favorite aspect of Resident Evil comes into play. RE uses pre 
pre-rendered backgrounds, which are essentially still images edited with effects layers to give you that illusion of depth in every room. Not only is this a very cool and artistic way of presenting a video game world, but it saves a lot of memory, freeing up space for the devs to flesh out other parts of the game, like the very well-polished aiming and shooting, quick and responsive movement, and all of those creepy crawlies you'll be struggling to survive against on your adventure. The way the camera is positioned in the environment is also masterfully done, in my opinion. You almost always hear creatures before you see them. The build-up to their reveal is always heart-racing because you barely know where they are when stepping into a room. When you do know where they are, you feel like a badass who's gained the proper knowledge of their surroundings, like a true survival master. The entire game is so well-paced and just keeps moving. There's never really a dull moment while exploring. Which, speaking of that in particular, let's quickly run through this game's events. Our adventure begins in the labyrinthine abandoned mansion. After solving a few puzzles, dodging a python straight out of your nightmares, and unlocking the mansion's back door, the game opens up. The outer guardhouse is like a smaller mansion where you face off against out-of-this-world threats like Plant 42 and the massive megalodon Neptune. Taking out the very alien-looking plant monster nets us a key for the main house. It's also here where our lost captain, Albert Wesker, shows up again to order us back to the mansion to continue our investigation. He seems quite eager to separate again just after reuniting. Hmm, very suspicious. Upon re-entry is where we see Capcom being very smart about this game's intentional padding. There are a few more rooms we couldn't explore earlier due to the lack of a key, but we're also jumped by the absolutely horrifying Hunters. These frogs from hell are bullet sponges that can end your character with a single decapitating slice. These guys are no joke. After finally dealing with our Python friend and collecting a few more keys, we find ourselves in a secret lab found beyond a hidden cave system under the mansion. In the lab is where all of our questions are answered. Turns out the monsters we fought throughout the game were created by the evil Umbrella Corporation, and looking through some files reveals that Captain Wesker was part of their terrible schemes. What the heck, man? I trusted you. After running into him again, he calls us an idiot. You guys are idiots and reveals his ultimate life form. That's right. This is the ultimate life form. Tyrant. <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Stop it. Wesker totally underestimates his creation and bites the dust hard. Go to hell. What? Don't come this way. No! Taking out Tyrant in an admittedly easy boss fight finally leads us to a helipad where we signal Star's team member Brad to pick us up. But once again, like the raving undead before it, Tyrant is back on his feet. Brad throws down a rocket launcher, and with it, we put a stop to this nightmare. It's coming! Jill! Kill that monster! You're our Amazon, Jill! The surviving members of STARS escape as the mansion's self-destruct activates. We made it. RE's basic premise being just escape the mansion is so beautiful because it allows mini-stories to play out naturally through the gameplay. You'll always remember how Yawn or Black Tiger or that one U-shaped hallway filled with zombies almost murdered your ass over whatever a character said in a cutscene an hour ago. It's horror and storytelling that go hand in hand to create a very immersive experience. Even if the characters sound kinda silly, I think it all works in this game's favor. It's just another notch on that figurative memorability belt that Resident Evil wears proudly around town. There's no way you'd forget Barry or Wesker. It might sound a little dramatic here, but the first Resident Evil was nothing short of a cultural reset for the medium of video games. It's such a great title whose problems never overshadow all of the positives it brought to the table back in 1996. Gamers were absolutely raving over this title. Resident Evil is a textbook case of making something truly inspiring and creative out of limitations and simplicity. Resident Evil 1996, its upgraded director's cut version, and the myriad of re-releases that came after it are all fantastic and games you shouldn't miss out on. If for whatever reason you haven't played it yet, this original version, please correct that. I think you'll be very surprised with how well it's held up. Voice acting and all, I don't care. I love it. What's that? An incoming transmission? I wonder who it is. 
Hello, I'm Heidi Anderson Swan, and I played Jill Valentine in Resident Evil Remake. Happy anniversary! Happy 25 years! This is incredible! I can tell you that for me, it has been an honor to be a part of this game series and to be a part of this wonderful and welcoming community. I thank you to everyone who has been so kind to me. And now I would like to introduce the cause players. Let's check them out. Man, that Resident Evil was scary. For as scary as it was, however, it sure did connect with a lot of people all around the world. I don't know if you guys know this, but the first Resident Evil title sold a lot of copies and made tons of money. And like anything that makes a lot of money, more of it was bound to come out. That's right, we're recapping gaming's perfect sequel. Oh, I'm getting another call. <laughs> Hello? Hey, Susie. It's Jill. Uh, look, did you pick up my STARS uniform from the cleaners? Because it's been missing for weeks. I can't find it anywhere. If it was you, it's it's fine. Nemesis is on my ass. Look, uh, let's, let's catch up soon, all right? Bye. Poor girl. She's probably wearing her tank top. Only one month after the first Resident Evil's launch, a sequel was in development. Stepping down from the director role, Shinji Mikami would appoint fresh-faced developer Hideki Kamiya on director's duties for this very ambitious sequel. The basic idea of RE2 was to take RE1's concept to a much larger scale, that being a zombie outbreak inside Raccoon City, where the main stage was exploring and finding an exit out of the city through the Raccoon City Police Department. Apparently at the 80% completion mark, producer Mikami was not satisfied with what Kamiya's team was making. Scrapping the entire game and starting from scratch, this renewed Resident Evil 2 would be the game we all got back in 1998. This title still maintained a bunch of characters and the police station setting from the starting build, but the game's story would be overhauled by actual screenwriter Noburo Sugimura. Sugimura was hired on to inject more life into this game's scenario and characters, and honestly, he did a fantastic fantastic job because RE2 is legendary, so let's talk about it. RE2's gameplay formula is exactly the same as the first game, just a bit more polished. Once again, you can choose to play as one of two characters, the rookie police officer, Leon Kennedy, or the college biker babe, Claire Redfield. Unlike the first game where Jill and Chris played through a largely similar story with a different supporting character, Leon and Claire would experience their own set of events and meet specific characters. The game's story also plays out in a different way depending on who you play as first. So if you choose Leon first, he enters the police station through the front door, and when you get to Claire, she enters the building through one of its many back doors. This can happen the other way around as well, and it's these multiple scenarios coupled with its fast-paced, polished gameplay and engaging story that really gives RE2 a high level of replayability. Much like the first game, the level design is great. The RPD is another labyrinth of corridors with freakish enemies just out of sight. Where RE1 felt a bit more open-ended in its design, RE2 is definitely more linear. A lot of the time, if you find a key item, it'll often lead you to a room that has another key, and that'll lead you to the next room that you have to go to, and so on and so on. Of course, there are a few puzzle doors that you have to find two or even four items to open. It's weird, because the puzzles in this game don't feel as present as RE1's. There's a lot of find a key, open a door, find a crank, open a staircase, find some emblems, clear a path in the sewer system, and many other things just like this. I don't think this is bad, by the way. One of the goals the devs had in mind when making this game was for it to feel more like a Hollywood action movie. So 
RE2's very well-paced level progression is totally doing its job. It's like a slightly more action-packed and focused version of RE1. And speaking of RE1, that game had some pretty impressive pre-rendered backgrounds for 1996, right? RE2 blows its predecessor out of the water with its backgrounds. There's so much detail in basically every room. I love how gritty and colorful and claustrophobic a lot of the locales are. It has such a 90s grungy comic book vibe with the countless objects strewn around and the general chaos of it all. RE2's game world feels like you're running through a disaster zone. It's such a great upgrade from the first game. I don't know, the rooms are so lifelike. I feel as if I'm there. I'm in the game. Hey, Leon. What's up, Susie? Hi, Leon. This is not how I imagined my first day. You know, I've been saying that to myself every day for the past two years. You've been stuck here for two years? What the hell? I can't find the damn club key. Jesus Christ. Well, all things considered, I'm actually doing pretty well. I've had about 350 run-ins with X. What the? He's coming back. I'm out of here. Ugh, is this a fucking joke? Get off! <sighs> you got this. Okay, I think I have a quick sec. Oh yeah, and before I forget, to all things Resident Evil and every single fan out there, happy 25th anniversary. Gotta keep going! <sighs> Leon's great. I love that guy. Anyway, Claire Redfield, sister of Game One's protagonist, Chris, is a well-trained and caring markswoman who enters Raccoon City just looking for her brother on vacation. Leon also enters the city at the same time. The two souls meet up at the start and decide to seek shelter at the RPD after running from a horde of zombies. They're both separated shortly after uniting, but make their way to the station. While exploring, Claire runs into a bunch of zombies, but also a new threat, the very iconic Lickers. Claire eventually finds Sherry Birkin, a lost young girl whose parents work for the Umbrella Corporation. Claire and Sherry's relationship throughout the story is very wholesome. Claire is 100% a scary, overprotective older sister. Do not mess with Sherry or you're dead. Before entering the sewer system hidden underneath the police station, Claire discovers that Sherry's father is actually around and looking for her. The problem is that Sherry's father is a mutated freak. When Claire and Sherry finally make it down to the secret umbrella lab under the city, Sherry passes out. She's been infected by her father, William, in his mutated state. In the lab, Claire runs into so many horrifying nightmares, and also Sherry's mother, Annette, who's tragically killed by her husband. Annette tells Claire how to cure Sherry, and we do that as the final puzzle of Claire's game, while also taking out William and escaping on a secret train headed out of the city. On the other side of things, we have Leon, who, by the way, is the most all-American Boy Scout. He tries his best to uphold the law in Raccoon City while surviving a frickin' zombie apocalypse. Using his genius law enforcement training and taking a command presence whenever someone he's unfamiliar with is around, no one ever takes him seriously. In this side of the story, Leon is pursued by a terrifying T-103 tyrant, an upgraded model from the guy we met in RE1. This guy's commonly known as Mr. X, and he constantly cuts Leon off whenever he can, showing up when you least expect him. Once Leon reaches the basement of the RPD, he encounters a very shady survivor. Chasing after this mysterious woman by the name of Ada Wong, Leon doesn't understand that he's walking into a trap that he'll never escape from. This enigmatic woman has Leon wrapped around her finger. It starts off so innocent and builds in the cutest way with Leon being blinded by justice, wanting to make sure this woman is safe at all times, just going with everything she says. Eventually, Ada's game comes to an end in a somber goodbye to Leon after being killed by the massive tyrant. Leon changes here, going from that bright-eyed rookie to a badass survivor with only one goal, escape. 
Leon is contacted by Claire in the lab and told to get Sherry, and the two head down to the Umbrella train platform. Leon gets the train back up and running, but is intercepted by Tyrant. After some time, a shadowy figure drops Leon a rocket launcher. It's Ada. Game over. As the train begins its departure, Claire gets on, but this isn't the end. William Birkins followed Claire and we gear up for one final explosive showdown. Using his new survival instincts, Leon holds the monster back while Claire and Sherry stop the train. All three survivors escape the tunnel as it explodes, eliminating Birkin in the process. Here, we get the second best line in video game history. So, it's finally over. Sherry, you look terrible. No worse than you, Claire. Come on, time to leave. Now? What's wrong? Is something following us? We have to go. We don't have any time to waste. Go? Where? Hey, it's up to us to take out Umbrella. <laughs> Resident Evil 2 improved basically everything from the first game. Aside from my singular complaint of the game feeling a bit linear, RE2 shines so bright through its characters, the engaging story, the larger-than-life boss battles, the aesthetic, the voice acting, I could go on all day. RE2 is truly legendary. It's one of the most popular and highly rated Resident Evil games of all time, and <laughs> in general for good reason. I wanted to shout out the voice actors for Leon and Claire since this is a celebration, and I've got something really important to talk about. Firstly, Claire Redfield was made for Allison Court. Court's charisma and personality comes through in the character in ways that only great actors are able to achieve. After voicing Claire for over 10 years in a variety of games, she really made the character her own. There's a very clear line of passion and personality between hers and the other actors who would go on to portray Claire after Allison left the series. I don't really think her charisma has been replicated or matched since her last performance. By no means am I saying the other actors who have played Claire are bad, but Allison Court is the Claire Redfield that I grew up with. Claire's strong, caring, and kind, just like the real person. Last year, the RE community was hit with news that I don't think any of us ever wanted to hear. The original voice actor for Leon, Paul Haddad, sadly passed away. Like Allison Court, Paul made Leon the character we all know and love. He gave Leon his voice. Unfortunately, Paul's career was cut short due to stage 3 throat cancer. He had been battling this for years. Paul went through a lot of surgical procedures, a lot of pain, mental, and physical. The surgeries weren't enough. He was taken from us far too soon. <laughs> when the news broke, a very clear silence fell over the community. I remember getting so many phone calls from friends and family about this. Thousands of tweets were posted in remembrance of Paul. Hideki Kamiya, the director of RE2, even commented on the matter. Even though this is undeniably sad, I think it's so beautiful how that many people came out to share their memories and love for Leon and the actor that played him. A man who probably didn't know just how loved he was. Paul was never the most famous actor or voice actor, but his performance as Leon means a lot to me. Whenever I think of this character, it's his version. We've lost a few people in the Resident Evil family. Things like this tend to happen to big fan bases. This hit hard for a lot of us. You never imagine that your heroes are gonna die. When Paul passed away, I just, I, I, I couldn't believe it. It was so weird and shocking for me because I, had a very brief opportunity to talk to him one time, a very long time ago, and he was very nice to me, and he just thanked me for remembering him as Leon. Life is shockingly fragile. I hope wherever you are, Paul, you know that Resident Evil fans still love you. We will never forget you. Rest in peace, Paul Haddad. The original, Leon Scott Kennedy.
Hey guys, uh, it's Jeff Shine, voice of Carlos Oliveira and Chris Redfield in Resident Evil. I just wanted to say uh, how grateful we are to everybody, uh, what amazing community you are. And uh, if you stick around, you're going to get to check out some amazing, amazing fan art that some very talented people have contributed. So uh, here's to you guys, here's to the uh, RE universe and uh, the amazing community that comes with it. So happy 25th and uh, here's to 25 more. What? I had to put my street clothes on. It was really tough sneaking that uniform back into the star's armory. I had to dodge Captain Wesker. What a creep. Believe me, Jill's gonna need that armor more than me if she plans on surviving Nemesis. So one year after the world-shattering release of RE2 is when we'd get Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, or as it's known in Japan, Last Escape. A true thrill ride of a game starring everyone's favorite STARS member, Jill Valentine. In her desperate struggle to escape from the ultimate B.O.W., Jill finds herself allying with an unlikely third party, that being the UBCS, Umbrella's very own hired security force. This game focuses a lot on Jill, making for a more personal story for our leading lady. RE3 is a much more action-oriented game compared to its predecessors, pretty much out of the gate after Jill literally jumps through an explosion, escaping her apartment and a horde of zombies. An all-new ammo crafting system is introduced where you can make loads of ammo on the fly with the necessary gunpowder. Jill is also way more agile this time around, sporting an actual dodge move that is very satisfying to pull off, but almost impossible possible to use effectively out of the gate. Seeing and exploring the open-ended, backtrackable streets of Raccoon City was a dream come true back in 1999. RE3 shares that aesthetically pleasing, colorful, gritty comic book visual style with RE2. This time, Jill has to explore the up and downtown areas of Raccoon City, and inside those areas are a multitude of buildings you'll be searching for items and keys to progress. RE3 does something really impressive, and that's having actual puzzles. This title has probably the hardest puzzles in the entire series. Where RE1's puzzles were pretty simple and RE2's almost non-existent, RE3's are absolutely no joke. Literally every puzzle in this game is hard, and I think the biggest contributing factor to that is that each puzzle has multiple solutions that are randomized on repeat playthroughs. The gem puzzle in the clock tower is insane the first time you see it. The oil additive puzzle is like trying to learn a different language. I literally press every button until it works. And the water puzzle. Oh my god, the water puzzle. This thing, before you figure out how it works, is rage inducing. It'll most definitely add an hour or two onto your endgame completion time. For as difficult as all of these are, they all have set solutions to them. And if you write them down or commit them to memory, you won't be losing too much of your sanity. Basically what I'm trying to say is, I won't judge you for looking up the solutions. One thing I've heard a lot over the years is that RE3 is nothing more than an asset flip of RE2 using the same models and environments. That couldn't be further from the truth. I think most people get to the RPD, you know, the building that looks exactly the same as it did in RE2 with the exact same pre-rendered backgrounds, and then get their ass beaten by Nemesis and never actually finish the game, because literally everything before and after the RPD is brand new content. Even the zombies are completely new models with their own speedy animations. There isn't a single single reused enemy or weapon from RE2. Literally everything is new and different. I'm not sure where this mindset came from, but I thought I should address it here because I feel RE3 usually gets unfairly criticized about this stuff, and I think it's really weird. But anyway, let's talk all about the story of Resident Evil 3. Jill's journey sees her exploring the vast open city, taking down hordes of zombies and new monsters like the Drain Demos, meeting the UBCS, Carlos, and Shady Nikolai in particular, joining their team while dodging Nemesis. Nemesis is fantastic. This guy actually follows Jill all throughout the city. 
Nemesis isn't a random encounter, as he may appear at first. All of his battles are scripted, but play out differently depending on what paths you take on your journey. The goal in the first third is to power up a cable car. You have to collect three items to get this done, all while Nemesis is pursuing you. You can choose to fight this guy, but you'll be spending a lot of resources in the process. You will snag some pretty hefty rewards if you manage to best him, however. I love doing runs where I take out Nemesis over and over again. And by the way, if you want to consistently do this, here's a cheat code from me to you. Nemi absolutely hates freeze rounds. You're welcome. After the city chapter, Jill and Carlos ride the cable car to the city's clock tower, which slows the game down quite a bit, reverting back to an almost RE1 level pace. The clock tower chapter is my favorite part of this game. The gothic horror vibe is there, we've got puzzles, new enemies in the giant spiders, and it comes right after shaking off Nemesis, who you don't know if is alive or dead, so tensions are pretty high as you explore this decrepit old building. Eventually, Jill gets the tower's bell ringing, which signals a UBCS escort chopper, but Nemesis takes it down. After a pretty grueling battle with the monster, Jill is left incapacitated and infected, leaving Carlos to find a cure in the neighboring hospital. Carlos whips up the cure and Jill heads deeper into the city, eventually finding passage into a secret umbrella facility, the Dead Factory. It's here where we finally make our last escape. Uh, just after solving the fucking water puzzle. Damn it! Nemesis eventually cuts off Jill in the factory, and it's here, with the aid of some acid, we end up mangling Nemesis, totally dismembering him in the process. Now that he's done and gone for good, it's time we get the hell out of here. Carlos and Jill manage to get a hold of someone flying around the city. That voice. It sounds so familiar. Star, please come in, Jill. Come in. Hey! He just called your name! Who could it be? As Jill hurries over to the heliport, she's jumped one more time by Nemesis. This time, he's nothing more than a slug of flesh writhing on the ground. I gotta say, when the track Final Metamorphosis slowly creeps into the scene, it is the most hype moment in the series for me personally. With no damage being dealt by Jill's weaponry, she decides to power up an experimental rail cannon, and leading the blobby creature in front of the laser absolutely decimates it. But we're not done yet. This is our last escape, right? Might as well go out in style, with the best line in video game history. You want stars? I'll give you stars. Now that's what I'm talking about. Jill and Carlos make it to the helicopter, and would you look at that, it's Barry coming in clutch with one last rescue. Out of the original trilogy, RE3 is my favorite. It takes the improvements made in RE2 and adds even more of them, like quick turning, and things like ammo crafting, story choices, and dodging. Nemesis is also such a great idea, taking Mr. X and going, what if that guy could actually follow you around? For a game that requires backtracking to progress, it's so cool how the devs set up Nemesis appearances when you think you're safe and heading towards familiar territory, only for this hulking goon to stop you in your tracks. I love RE3 Nemesis. I feel it often lives in RE2's shadow for a lot of fans, but I just wanted to say that I think it's awesome and a worthy successor to RE2. I personally feel it does a lot more for replayability than the first two games ever did. I regularly play this game still. There's so many ways to play it, whether you're taking different paths in the story, or just doing a run with a specific weapon type, upgrading it as you defeat Nemesis, improving your skills with each successive playthrough, unlocking new costumes, getting better at mercenaries, seeing the seven different epilogues for each main character in the trilogy play out, it's all so good. For me, it's the perfect gameplay package of challenge and rewarding skillful play in the survival horror space. It's definitely a bit more action-oriented than its predecessors, but that is not a bad thing at all. It's really fun, and the perfect cap-off to this trilogy of survival horror classics. For Resident Evil's 25th anniversary, I wanted to revisit the original trilogy, three of my all-time favorite games that helped build the RE series that we all know and love today. These three titles mean a lot to me. I got them all at the same time back in 1999, and pretty much played them back to back with my family. I have amazing memories of when I first laid eyes on the main zombie at the start of one. I remember being scared shitless with my friends, encountering that very first liquor in RE2, and Nemesis still haunts my nightmares. 
Resident Evil as a series was a huge factor in helping shape me as a person. I'm sure a lot of you guys have similar stories. I'm sure these games also mean the world to you too. Ever since I started this channel and began talking about horror games, Resident Evil specifically, it felt like a dream come true to me. Like. This is my job now. My life is forever changed. I've met so many great people while doing this, a lot of which I'm happy to call friends. Sometimes this whole content creator gig can get stressful. I see a lot of opinions all the time, every day. And yeah, that can get very overwhelming and even burn me out on video making. The past few months I've been replaying the classic RE series, and honestly, I feel rejuvenated. They remind me of a much simpler time, where the internet wasn't as much of a thing and I could just escape for a while from whatever horrors I was facing in my childhood. It's one of those things where, no matter what point I'm at in my life, I always find a moment of relief with Resident Evil. I know as a community we don't always get along, but I just wanted to say that I think you're all pretty great. This series attracts the most passionate people I've ever met in my life. The amount of love and care that goes into making some of the amazing cosplays, artwork, and internet content is truly inspiring. I've been down in the dumps this year, and seeing all of you guys just do your thing has really kept me going. And I wanted to make this video as tribute to not only some of my favorite games, but to you, the people who support me, the people who give me constructive criticism, the people who are there for me in my personal life. I just wanted to say thanks. If you're a classic fan who's been here since day one, or a brand new fan who joined up recently, I accept you all into my personal Resident Evil community. Even if you're exclusively a fan of the movies, you can join in too. Let's keep the survival horror dream alive together for another 25 years. Happy 25th anniversary, Resident Evil. You've changed my life. Who is it this time? Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Oh, yes, well, who are you and what do you want? Uh, nothing. You're the one that called me. I most certainly did not. You called me. I didn't. Me. Oh, listen, I don't have time for this. There's a strange man in the castle, so... I need to slice him to ribbons. <laughs> uh, okay, lady. Well, have a good time with that. Ta! Who are these people? Look, there's something important I've got to tell you. I'm sure you're curious what comes next for Resident Evil. Now that we've basically recapped one, two, and three... I bet you're wondering what my next video is going to be. Oh, what's that? I see something over the horizon. Something about quick time events? Cameras that go over your shoulder? Open your eyes, dude. We're going next gen. It's about time. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for all of your support. This video was a dedication to my favorite video game series, as well as all of my viewers, all of you guys who have made this channel possible. You guys have no idea what you mean to me. Yes, Resident Evil 4 is my next video. If you liked this video, please consider subscribing and checking out my Patreon down in the description. Okay, I'm gonna let Sunny play us out. Later.